All right, welcome everybody to our third session this afternoon at the Word on the Street Teen, uh, I usually say Teen Tent, sure, Teen Tent, even though we're not in a tent this year, uh, presented by the Lethbridge Herald. They're our sponsor for the teen sessions uh, this year, so thank you to them. Um, thank you to all of you for attending, and a special thank you uh, to Nafisa Asad for joining us this afternoon. We're excited to hear about her book and her stories and maybe a bit about herself and her writing. Um, I'm going to start off uh, the presentation as we always do by talking a little bit about where we are here in Lethbridge. Um, we aren't at the Lethbridge Public Library, all of us. Many of us are in Lethbridge. Some of us will be elsewhere. Um, but the Lethbridge Public Library in Lethbridge is um, the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains. And so we like to always pay respect and acknowledge the Blackfoot people past, present and future and recognize and respect cultural heritage, belief, relationships to the land. And for me, stories as well that come out of that history and present and future, because future stories are the best stories. Uh, mm -hmm. The city of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And again, always just something that we keep in mind when we're, when we're gathering and, and talking. Um, so welcome again to Word on the Street Teen Zone um, and just a few, I guess, housekeeping things. There is a Q&A portion to Zoom, um, which is a little sort of text box down at the bottom. You can toss questions, <clears throat> excuse me, toss questions in there should you have any and I will make sure that Nafisa uh, gets the questions and we'll have a nice little discussion at the end. Um, but uh, I think that's about it. Oh, and then I also have a copy of the book to give away at the end. So we'll do a little a giveaway at the end, which is a fun way to wrap up. So welcome, Nafisa. Thank you for joining us. And um, let's tell the people who you are. <laughs> um, I like that uh, your bio says you are a self-identified island girl because islands are great. Um, you have hurricanes in your blood and dream of a time when you can exist solely on mangoes and pineapple, which I think is a very solid goal, um, <laughs> especially in the winter. Don't come to the prairies in the winter. Um, you were born in Fiji and you live in Vancouver and you read too many books. You watch too many K-dramas. I might have to pick your name, your brain on which ones I should be ordering for the library. Uh, and you write stories about girls taking over the world, which is awesome and always or often anyhow the best type of books. Um, the book you're going to be talking about today is this one, The Candle and the Flame, which yeah. is a fantastic book, though I'm only about halfway through. So I'm trying to I, if, I, if I suddenly go like this, <laughs> I don't want any spoilers. <laughs> so welcome and we can't wait to hear from your book. Okay, thank you for having me and I'm thrilled to be reading from The Candle and the Flame. I'll read um, an excerpts that will show you glimpses of the book and of the characters in them, especially the women, because let's face it, my books are all about the women. Other people can write about the guys. And if we have time at the end, I'm going to read you a little bit, an excerpt from my upcoming book, which is coming out next year from Simon & Schuster. So without further ado, let's get started. And the first excerpt will give you a glimpse of Noor, the city in which the candle and the flame is um, set. If you have read the book, you will realize that um, the setting is very much a character and that um, it breathes and lives alongside actual breathing and, you know, living people. So here's how Fatima Ghazala sees Noor. The Noor Fatima Ghazala knows is not one that is easily visible to those born in wealth and privilege. It never was. She remembers exploring the city with her adoptive father, her small hand held snugly in his much larger one. Noor, Jagan told her, means light, but not just any light. Noor means heavenly light, the kind of light you see in a mother's face the first time she sees her child. The Noor Fatima Ghazala walks in now is vastly different from the Noor she grew up in. Firdos taught her that no city is ever a simple sum of its streets and buildings. Neither is Noor. The city of Noor is a harmony of her people and her places. Fatima Ghazala intends to show the Emir this. She takes him through colorful alleys composed of narrow walks and tiny shops selling everything from candle to jewelry made of blue beads and silver pieces. They walk through a street that is perfectly ordinary except for the 
the rioting of hot pink bougainvillea flowers on the walls between the houses and the sidewalk. Along the way, she shows him the poetry, sometimes written, sometimes drawn, on doors and doorsteps, on the walls and in hidden alcoves, love letters to the city from the people she shelters. She takes him to a Buddhist temple on a leafy hill in southern Nul, where cats gather after dark. A grove of, of date palms in northern Nul that yield the sweetest mud jewel dates. They eat sugar cane and drink coconut milk. From a grisly vendor wearing an umbi patent kurta, they buy, they buy naan stuffed with roasted meat and vegetables, which they wash down with glasses of shikhe they purchase from a Han vendor. So it's mostly about food. I mean, <laughs> that's a I solid like decision. Food. Yep. <laughs> so the next um, excerpt features someone called the Rajkumar. Rajkumar, if you're not aware of it, means the prince. This is your first glimpse, but not your only glimpse, sadly, that you will get of him. The Rajkumar moves to intercept Fatima Ghazala. Oh, come now. You simply cannot leave. Not after I made the time to be here. Sunaina notices Fatima Ghazala tense. The Rajkumar continues. I am especially interested in your views of the, on the jinn. The question is abrupt and completely unexpected, but it doesn't make it any less dangerous. The tension in the room rises as if the very walls are holding their breath. Do you not hate the Ifrit? How can you not after being through the attacks, Arab says, that's the Rajkumar. His tone is sympathetic. In fact, I would be surprised if you didn't hate them. I will be leaving then, Fatima Ghazala says, and leaves the room without even looking at the prince. What is wrong with you, Arav? Can't you stop spewing hate every chance you get? Why would Fatima Ghazala hate the Ifrit? Bhavia, she's the princess, rages. Your logic is skewed. The Ifrit were the ones who saved Nur City. They are the heroes. They are jinn. Arab says as if that is enough. I have neither the time nor the desire to discuss this matter with a superficial fool like you. The Rajkumar stalks out of the room. I hate him, Bhavia mutters. She glances at Sunaina, that's Fatima Ghazala's sister. I hope you do not share my idiot brother's narrow-minded opinions. They are jinn, Sunaina says carefully. Bhavia exhales. Listen, Sunaina. If we follow Arab's reasoning, we would have to execute an entire city just because one among their number is a murderer. Does that sound right to you? You weren't there during the attacks, Rajkumari Bhavya. You don't know what it was like. I lost everything, everyone, Sunena says flatly. She knows she should not be speaking out of turn, that she should pretend not to even have opinions, but she can't. Not on this matter. She cannot keep her silence. You have your sister, don't you? Pavia asks. You have your life. You do not understand. Sunaina shakes her head. What could a spoiled princess like Pavia know about grief? About terror? She has spent her entire life being closeted. My brother came home in peace. At least we think the pieces were our brother. My father didn't come home at all. Not even in pieces. Pavia's voice is hard. I am certain I do understand. Sunana looks at the Rajkumari, feeling tears threaten. You can't judge an entire population of a people by the actions of a select few. You can't use your grief and your sorrow to justify your hate and your discrimination. My father taught me that, didn't yours? Sunana has no response to that question. Okay, that was a bit heavy. <laughs> And the next one is slightly heavier, but it perfectly illustrates what um, death is for the people in the book. People, Firdos told Fatima Ghazala, are afraid of death for two very different reasons. The first one is obvious. They do not know what, if anything, lies beyond the veil. That is a matter of faith. The second reason is also obvious. People are, being, are afraid of being forgotten. They live their lives carving themselves spaces in time and history, only to be forgotten anyway. Even those who gain fame or notoriety fall victim to time. What people remember are not individuals directly, but as they were experienced by the people who knew them. A person's truth, a person's essence, fades with a person's death. That is simply the way of life. Okay. 
And now we move on to something that you might be familiar with if you have siblings, especially sisters. This is the conflict between Sunaina and Fatima Ghazala, who are, who are adopted sisters. Okay. It is a little after seven in the evening and the low levels of Southern Aftab, that's the palace, are mostly deserted. Sunaina has just finished her day's walk and is cleaning up. She leaves the door to her rooms open to let some of the heat out. A pleasant ache, the sign of walk well done, has her rolling her shoulders. The walk is fulfilling, creating cosmetics makes her happy. Being at the Mahal while doing this walk that she loves makes her happier, or it should. There's no reason for her to be sad. Her hours are full and she sleeps through the night, mostly. So she has nightmares. Who doesn't? So she misses her sister. Why can't she? It would be strange if she didn't. Lost in her thoughts, Sunana sinks down in a chair. She hasn't seen Fatima Ghazala since her first day at the Mahal. She doesn't know what Fatima Ghazala does at the Mahal or where she goes and who she spends time with. And that just fine, Sunaina tells her. Fatima Ghazala can take care of herself. But then she remembers the filthy eyes with which the Rajkumar was looking at her sister. She worries. Just then, as if someone has carved her right out of her thoughts, Fatima Ghazala walks past the open doors of Sunaina's room. Sunaina jumps to her feet. A few seconds later, Rajkumar Ara follows in Fatima's, Fatima Ghazala's footsteps. Sunaina runs to open doors and peeks out. The corridor outside is enveloped in shadows. No one apart from the servants uses this corridor. The servants have all retired for the night. Sunaina watches the Rajkumar stalk her sister, who walks ahead seemingly oblivious to the danger. She watches the Rajkumar lift her hand, perhaps to grab her sister's shoulder. Fatima Ghazala! Sunaina is unaware of speaking out until her exclamation explinters the sights. Fatima Ghazala whirls around. Upon seeing the Rajkumar so close to her, her eye widen. Rajkumar turns and gives Sunaina an annoyed look before he continues walking. Fatima Ghazala turns and watches the prince walk away. Fatima Ghazala, come here, Sunaina commands. The reluctance on her sister's face hurts Sunaina. But really, how could she expect anything different? I have somewhere I need to be. You will come here right now. Sunaina's tone brooks no disobedience. Fatima Ghazala, scowling, starts her way into Sunaina's room. She folds her arms and stands right in front of the doors, her face mutinous. Sit, Sunaina says. No, Fatima Ghazala repeats. Sunaina's heart lurches at the emptiness in her sister's eyes. Did she put it there? If this is about the Rajkumar, you didn't worry. I would have handled him. How? He's the prince. We are lower than the dirt on his shoes. Her sister refuses to see anyone in the way society dictates they should be seen. For her, everyone is equal. Have you forgotten, Didi? I am a monster, Fatima Ghazala bites him. If he had touched me, he would have regretted it. Can you handle the consequences of harming the Rajkumar of Kirat? Sunana asks. Listen, Didi, ah, my apologies. I can't call you that, can I? Not anymore. You do not need to pretend to care about me. In fact, please don't. I will try not to burden you with my monstrous presence. Fatima Ghazala turns to leave. I'm sorry, the apology bursts out from Sunana's lips. Fatima Ghazala turns around, a weary look on her face. Sorry for what? Sorry for calling you a monster. Sorry for making you leave. I'm just sorry. I was, I'm scared of the jinn and the idea that you are one terrifies me, but you are the best person I know and you may be a genie. I'm not making much sense, I know. I'm just sorry. So Nana winces her way through her apology, aware that she sounds inept, but unable to help herself. Will you forgive me? I don't know, Fatima Ghazala says. Her eyes are very large on her face. I will try. She leaves. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that. I enjoyed reading it. <laughs> and the final excerpt shows you. Give me one second. Ruiz. No, something. Sorry, it's my nephew. <laughs> no worries. No worries. I'm 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 talking to someone right now. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, and the last um, excerpt shows you a glimpse of Aruna, who is the Maharani of, uh, who's the Empress of the, of Kirat. And she shows, she flexes, <laughs> basically. Flames flutter in fluted glass lamps, illuminating rich rugs, fine silks, and the kind of grandeur most people cannot imagine. 
present in the room, small by the standards set, set by others, are the royal family, excluding Pavia. The Maharaja, that's the emperor, glances at his brother. Arav, that horrible um, prince, stands turned away from the rest of them, his face in shadow. A familiar exasperation fills Arish, that's the emperor. This time, though, the exasperation is spiced liberally with anger. He had thought his brother a harmless flirt, but what he witnessed in the garden seems a lot more sinister and concerning. Predictably, it is his mother who speaks first. How long have you been harboring that creature in our midst? Not so predictably, it is his wife who responds to the Rajmata. I appreciate your concern for your son, Amma, but Fatima Ghazali's presence in the Mahal is not up for discussion right now. The issue at hand is that your son, my husband's brother, Rajkumar Arav, made unwanted advances on a woman. Do you have any idea who she is? Arish says, if only to deflect some of the anger directed at Aruna by his mother and aunt. It doesn't matter who she is, Aruna says, turning to Arush. She is truly, spectacularly angry, angrier than Arush has ever seen her. She could be a beggar on the streets and it would not excuse what the Rajkumar did. A woman's body is her own and no one has the right to touch it without her permission. It doesn't matter if you are a Rajkumar or the Maharaja. If a woman doesn't welcome you, advances don't make them. Aruna looks at the Rajkumar, who still won't look them in the eyes. I am ashamed of you, Arif. I expected so much better than you. And that brings us to the end of um, the readings from The Candle and the Flame. I hope you enjoyed them. It was awesome. We always like hearing um, authors read their books in their own voices, because then... <laughs> Or I, I do for sure, and I've heard that from some of our, our audience members t already today, because then we have your voice in our heads when we're reading. Yeah. So lovely. <laughs> okay, so since we do have time, mm -hmm. let me tell you a little bit about my upcoming book, which is yes. called The Wild Ones, A Broken Anthem for a Girl Nation. It is about a group of magical girls who go around the world by a magical corridor known as the Between saving other girls from situations they themselves escaped from. When they meet the keeper of between, they get embroiled in a fight for their lives and their freedom that will require the keenest wits and their bravest hearts. The Wild Ones will be released next summer by Simon & Schuster. Now, I have this a little tiny excerpt, an introduction. It is called an introduction <laughs> from the book. So here it goes. An introduction. Hold on to your hats. We are the wild ones. We are made of whimsy and lemon. We have the temerity to not just be women, but women of color. Women with melanin in our skin and voices in our throats. Voices that will not be vanquished. Not now, not ever. We will not be silenced. Just in case it needs to be said, all you need to be a girl to be a woman is to decide you are one. Your gender is your decision. There have been many of us over time and between time. We write glimpses of our stories, of the lives we led before we became wild, in a book of memories. We share some of our stories, some of its pages interspersed with Ian Pehili's story. Our lingua franca? Why, darlings, we speak all dialects of pain. Pehili's story is our story. We will give it shape, allow it reason, fashion it wings, and watch it fly. Now, are you ready? Take a deep breath. Let's be wild. And that comes out next um, summer. Lovely. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> okay, so I'm ready for any questions if you have them. I realize I've re read a bit fast. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Does anybody have any, oops, knocking papers everywhere. Does anyone have any questions from Nafisa? There's the Q&A thing at the bottom, so you can toss some questions in there. Anybody? Well, I, I will throw in a question um, about Noor, because okay. I'm very much enjoying the city, like I said, I'm about half, halfway through, excuse me, um, and it's quite cool. Um, so it's a city that's kind of been repopulated mm -hmm. by all wow. this mix of people, and you talk about the food, and I have to say I've very much enjoyed <laughs> all of that, but can you tell me a bit more about how kind of the, there's a forest side and a desert side, and how those kind of fit together okay so 
when I was, the first thing that came to me when I was writing uh, The Kennel and the Flame was actually a story about a place where um, names would be important. And then came the city, which lies on the um, forest, it lies on the border between a forest and a desert. So one side of it is the desert and the other side is the forest. So the forest side is um, ruled by the king of the country or rather the emperor who is uh, Irish and the uh, desert side and the desert side of the country, not just the city is um, ruled by the jinn, the Ifrit jinn who are a clan of uh, clan among the jinns they because they have clans they have the the ifrit and then the shaitin the bad ones the shaitin actually means uh devil so which basically is what they are <laughs> um the reason i did that was because i wanted to show like the, the time i wrote the book was it was it's still we're still in turmoil <laughs> it feels like we didn't stop after november 2016 it just kept on rolling <laughs> exactly so i i needed a place that i could escape to, to so i wrote a city in which things are not perfect but people actually exert the effort to make live not just livable but for harmony they 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 try they walk for harmony even though people there are vastly different from each other and their values may be different but they learn to how to accept each other and how to respect each other's customs so that's the very literal um expression of it was the desert and the um forest because if they can live in balance why can't people cool very cool all right we've got some questions coming in now um so Peyton would like to know who are your favorite YA authors? Um, are there any, or who inspired you? Oh my goodness. I <laughs> grew up a giant question. Like when you asked me that, I was like, oh my God, there's so many. <laughs> Where do I start? Okay, so specifically in my formative years, like as I was growing as a writer, as someone, uh, especially of fantasy, Kate Elliott, she inspired a lot of like, of reading her books and reading the way she wrote um, women, the power she gave her women and, and her prose, that taught me a lot about writing. Alison Crogan, uh, I'm not sure if the Pelinor, she wrote the Pelinor books. And if you like fantasy, her fantasies, especially the Pelinor fantasy, the scope is so epic. And I'm still in awe about at how she manages to create the, the geography of her world. I don't know how she does it because as the as the, her characters are walking the land, you can almost see the see the hills undulate and get and come into being. It's really amazing, and I'm still striving to do something like that. Um, and then there's uh, G. Willow Wilson in whose book I read the first Muslim woman who was who was wearing a hijab just like me. Fatima Kazala does not wear a hijab, but she was a dupatta at times. Um, so. Oh, uh, I, I read her and I had this epiphany. Why can't we be um, the protagonists of our own books? You know, why are we always the side characters? So she, there was her. And I also like um, Leigh Le Bardugo, her Six of Crows. Oh my God, that book was amazing. Kaz, just <laughs> the way it just... <laughs> All her prose, I have little, like I have um, underlined and then written in my diary. This is how I want to write someday. <laughs> um, there's also um, Karen Strong, whose middle grade book I've read, and Karuna Riazi, whose book I've read, XCO, Kat Cho, um, Sabina Khan. There are so many. I'm, <laughs> I mean, if we really want to talk about books, you just come and talk to me on Twitter and I, we will have to have this like one, one hour long conversation where I have to tell you exactly why I love the yes. books I do. <laughs> would be a good session. Books that are awesome. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> books that are awesome. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. Um, another question here uh, from Colette. I feel like a lot of your writing is very poetic. Do you write poetry as well? But to be honest, until like about six years ago, I thought I would only be able to write poetry because I could not fathom the idea of actually writing a novel. And then I had these, you know, when you are growing up, you have these dark years where you, you know, do things that are stupid. <laughs> Even though you know you're stupid, you, you still do them. So I stopped writing for a year or two because I felt that the world was too dark. And I think I lost my poetry that way. And then I started writing prose. I, I actually started writing vignettes. And then you grow from vignettes. And then I took some class. I actually did um, a, a master's in um, children's literature. 
at UBC, and there they have you have the choice of doing a um, thesis, a creative thesis, where you write a novel. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a novel under someone's uh, very strict but very um, helpful uh, um, supervision, and that actually led me to writing an actual novel that I never thought I had I, I, I had the potential for. So yeah, I, I do write a lot of poetry that I will never ever ever show anyone. Actually, no. Most of the poetry, it appears in um, The Wild Ones. I used the, the poetry to in that book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I pretended it was the characters, but it's actually mine. <laughs> so, yeah, I do write poetry once in a while. Actually, my diaries are in poetry, and I don't know why I used to do them. I used to write journals, and I would write it in poetry, but now that when I read them, I have no idea what was making me feel the way I was feeling. So I'm like, why don't you just write out what happened? <laughs> <laughs> but it came out like that instead. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's cool. Yeah. Very cool. Do we have other questions? If you, now's is your there, chance. Is there a question you always want to get asked and never get asked? Hmm. Oh, I want, why do you, why do you um, add so much food to your hmm. stories? Okay, so I actually thought this one over because when I was writing the, uh, the Kennel in the Flame, I was trying to showcase diversity without actually, you know, talking about this color of the skin and whatnot. And I was like, why don't I just use food? And if I use food to showcase how many different people there are, I can also showcase how the food is evolving. A lot of that was taken out, <laughs> but I wanted to show how the city was moving closer to becoming more harmonious by the way the food was, uh, one type of food was, uh, was um, um, cooked in a different kitchen mm -hmm. and how the fusion of the foods came about. Maybe that's another book altogether. <laughs> there was one, I just finished the part. Um, they've just, uh, two of them, two of the girls have just gone to a restaurant. Yeah, and they're talking about oh, eating that, non, that, but then yeah. also noodles. And oh yes. I'm like, yes, all the foods. All Why the food. Have all the delicious things. <laughs> exactly, I mean, that's a better way to show his diversity than, um, <laughs> Talking about the color of the skin, yeah. in my opinion. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? I don't know if you have read this part. Maybe, probably not, because you're only halfway, so you might want to. But I always <laughs> want to get asked about the bond between, like, there's this, the Zulfikar and Fatima Kazala bond together, and mm -hmm. nobody ever asks me about like this, about this bond because I, f I felt like it was one of my, you know, strongest creations, and nobody ever asked me that. And I'm like. Oh. Why? Because between among the um, the jinn, the ifrit, the married couples always have a bond, which is a sharing of their fire. Mm -hmm. What this does is lets them share their strength, their physical strength, and it also allows the wife and the husband, or the husband, and the whatever, to um, know where the other one is at any moment, just in case they have to um, locate like, if there's danger and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, which is I was about right where I am. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's she's romance she's there. just gone out into the desert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, I feel like that's about to come into play. Yeah. I mean, so you have to get through the marriage first. So, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yes. It's very, it's cool. I like, I like how you have, yeah, mixed up, mixed, not mixed up, but mixed the city and created the city. It feels like a place that would be very good to visit. I know that's exactly what I wanted to like I wanted to make people want to go there because I wanted to, so badly to go there as well I was like just I, if only there's no coronavirus there <laughs> no. <laughs> the, the yeah. gin would burn it out yeah I actually and it seems like such a, a big city with so many different different people and things like that so there you have all your secondary characters as as well um yeah you I think of writing other things in this world I actually wanted to, but my publisher was not on board, so I had to move on. I was actually writing um, because I always felt that Pavia, if you've read this, you're, I, I don't want to spoil anything. She's just she kind of, yeah, I know who she is. But. arc that I really like. She became my uh, favorite character, even though, like, she starts off as really, like, um, spoiled. But she has this character arc that I always feel guilty about because I feel like I did her wrong at the end. And I wanted to write a book in which she finally gains the chance to shine. But sadly, that didn't work out. So hopefully someday in the future, I'll get a chance to give her her country to rule. Yeah. I like the messenger 
system too. I think that's Me cool. Too. And that would be so cool. And how they kind of became, you know, they're, there's also kind of a Baker Street Irregulars kind of uh, network to them as well. Yes. yes, I mean, they're the spies. And I really like um, Achal Kaur mm -hmm. because she's she's so familiar to my own, um, like the, the women I know, the older women I know who are full of spunk and life. Yeah, and taking care of the people around her. Yes, yeah. giving them food, even though they don't I was going to say with sweets, yes. Yeah, with sweets. <laughs> Um, two more questions here from Colette. Uh, one of them, uh, what is your Twitter handle? Oh, it's at Nafiza, N-A-F-I-Z-A-A. -A. Excellent. So your first name with an extra A. Yes. Lovely. Um, and then another question, outside of showing culture or giving the city a personality, do you ever feel food tells you things about the characters too? Oh, definitely. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would love the idea of a very food focused novel to tell us about people and changing cultures. Okay, so if you have read The Candle and the Flame, you'll notice that the jinn eat a lot of sweets. They're always, that is because I didn't say it explicitly, but because their metabolism systems are so quick that the only thing that that they need to keep on eating sugar. And that's why they keep on eating sweets. And I gave it a hint that Fatima Ghazal really loved eating sugar as well because she has some of that in her too. So that was one of my ways to showcase um, personality. A plus gulab jamun, which I don't know if you've ever had gulab jamun, but if you haven't, you need to go find it. And, you know, I'm not sure you can find it now, but I'm sure online stores sell it. Oh, no, actually, it'll be in your supermarket. Mm -hmm. they, will, they do sell it in the in packages um, in the frozen aisle. So get some gulab jamun. It's very sweet. So if you have diabetes, don't eat it. But <laughs> if you can eat sugar, just go take one and just, enjoy it because it's one of the few pleasures in life that, you know, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> I like this. We're getting book recommendations and food recommendations. <laughs> yeah, glad jamun. And okay, the, we moved to a different house and the thing that made me most happy was that um, a few blocks away, there's this man who sells um, freshly made jalebi. <laughs> Okay. And in, in the autumn, like, and I'm like, you know, I can just walk over and buy jalebi whenever I want to. And then I found out that, you know, coronavirus has put a stop to that. And I was like, okay, this is why we can't have any good things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Excellent. Well, uh, we have about just over 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes. Um, oh, another question. Um, not a question, but it sounds like an amazing thing to do while reading the book eating all this week. yes definitely <laughs> excellent pairing <laughs> awesome um yeah anybody else with questions toss them on in um and then like i said i have a copy of the book i think i said i'm getting my sessions confused so i may not have said this but i do have a copy of the book to give away um so uh if you live in lethbridge you could win a copy of the book to take home and keep and make your own. And um, mm -hmm. one more thing, if whoever wins, you can give me, send me there, uh, or I will send some swag for you to give away with the- Ooh, Excellent, yeah, we can pair it with arts. swag. And I have some art that. that you guys oh, might Elizabeth enjoy. Elizabeth is telling me we absolutely have three copies, three copies. I just have one here, the other two are still at the library. Um, I got, you know, visual aids, so. Uh, we have copies of the book, three copies to give away. If there are any teenagers in the audience, I like to give you all preference. Um, so if you are a teenager, uh, pop into the Q&A part of the Zoom webinar and just let me know that you would like a copy. Um, I will give you a few minutes if you're a teenager to pop in there and let me know. If there aren't any teenagers, then I will open it up to the grown-ups in the crowd. Uh, grown-ups need books too, but you know, teenagers need books first. Yeah. <laughs> true. true. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so we have three copies of that one to give away. And I should send you some You do have to be in Lethbridge to pick it up. That's that's the catch. That's the only catch. Yeah. <laughs> or around, or be able to get to Lethbridge, I should say, to pick it up. If you live in Colhurst, that's totally cool. Or anywhere else. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, yeah, so I guess this would have put a lot of it would have cramped your touring, your book touring style. This whole, I actually this traveled whole a lot year. for this. <laughs> <really>. yeah. <laughs> I like staying at home, so. It's cozy to be at home. Yeah, I will give yeah. homes that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yes, we'll have to have you come back to Lethbridge some other time. Maybe after That's the next fine. one comes out. That would be awesome. Thank you for having me. 
Mm -hmm. This was fun. Lovely. It's lovely. Yeah, like I said, we always like to hear from from authors so that we have their voices in their heads when when we're reading their books. It adds that extra layer. Um, all right, so I don't see any teenagers popping in, but grown-ups, if you would like to pop in to the comments, let me know if you would like a copy of the book. As I said, I have three. So if there are more than three of you who would like a copy, I will do a little random number generator draw thing. Um, and let me know. So yes, excellent. All right, we've got two people so far. Anybody else out of my 10 person audience member? <laughs> Some of them are library staff, so I feel they, they have possibly read it already. Excellent. All right, well, it looks like we have a copy going to Ariana and a copy going to Carrie. I'm gonna just jot your names down. Again, I have one more after that. So um, if anybody else would like a copy, do let me know. And Ariana and Carrie, if you could let me know which branch you would like to pick your copies up, that would be great. And then I will make sure the book ends up where it needs to be. Awesome. Um, trying to think if I had any other really great questions. I have to look at my question cheat sheet. Um, are there, oh, this is a good one. I always like, you talked about your influences and things already. Um, are there any books uh, by other authors that you're excited about that are coming up? I am currently reading this that I think, I believe this came out this past Tuesday. Um, mm -hmm. It's Legendborn by Tracy Dion. Yes. And I'm also reading. Theft of Sunlight by Intisar Kanani. I recommend, oh, my books are all over the place. They're still packed. <laughs> so many books that I have read or I'm willing. Well, you know, um, Shannon Chakraborty's uh, City of Brass. Yes. Uh, those, those feature Jin as well. And um, anything by, uh, what's, wait. This book that I am really looking forward to. Oh, Kingdom of Souls by Rena Baron. I'm not sure if it's really great. I'm, I'm currently reading that too. I read a lot of like, I read a bit of uh, everything. Yes. Um, also, wait a minute. I recently read Too Much, How Victorian Constraints, this is hilarious, How Victorian Constraints Still Bind Women Today. And this was very well done, very well mm -hmm. written. It's, very it's not cool. very YA, but um i thought that was interesting yeah why teenagers still need to know that stuff <laughs> of course they do <laughs> oh and i have been reading um alberto manguel um i'm not sure um if you know him but he's the way he writes re writes about reading is so amazing it's he, it's poetry yes. and his prose is is just so well done so i i read his library at night and the history of reading, which was amazing. So I recommend both of those if you're curious about, if you're a reader curious about reading. So I recommend those two. Awesome. Oh, and one more question popping up. Um, how did you go about doing research for the book, if you did any research? A lot of the, the candle and the flame. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the research, it's, I didn't do as much research as that I wrote about my own life. And the, these, the things I wrote about the jinn, we, Muslims believe in the jinn. It's not a myth for us, but actual fact that they, they um, exist. So um, I talk to people. I um, Okay, I fictionalize them. Obviously, they don't come as, as Sunni as Zulfikar does, sadly. <laughs> so um, the clans, I talk to people who know this stuff. And the food was... Is just something that I've. I mean, I grew up in Fiji, which is a very, which is very multicultural. Mm -hmm. So it's all like these are all my own experiences that I um, turn into fiction. Yeah, for the wild ones, <laughs> the wild ones is set in twelve different cities around the world, and that was painful. I was I, I was actually questioning myself, but at the time I ended up why why did I do this to myself? So I did a lot of Google w walking through the virtually. Uh, through Google Maps, virtual yeah. streets, 
just to get a feel for what I would see. Sadly, I don't, they don't do smells, so I don't know what the city smelled like. But um, that was a whole lot more um, challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, keeping track of 12 different locations would have been a yeah, thing. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> did you have giant like spreadsheets and cheat sheets and like string going from one and the other? And like Actually, when I'm writing, I have books that I create along with like like this let me show you oh yeah so this is i'm working on a fairy tale right now so i have all sorts of writings and mm -hmm. um, pictures and aesthetics so just to go along with the story i'm creating so but when i'm done writing a book i also have a notebook accompanying so like a behind the scenes i will have di writer diary entries or just mm -hmm. what like questions to myself what are you doing right now what's wrong with you you know <laughs> that when you look back you read and you're like okay that was one part of it <laughs> yeah excellent well thank you very much for joining us today thank you so and much. i think we've got everybody's questions answered at least for now um lovely again to hear you read your story and to get you know that author experience to add to our readings um and we look forward we'll look forward i'm sure all of us to that next book awesome thank <laughs> you thanks so much for joining us